Good morning. Uh, I'm Lawrence Adams. I work in uh, uh, mobile technology at Pixar, uh, and I'm a GPU specialist there. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we use GPUs at Pixar. Uh, firstly, I'm going to give you an overview of the history of GPU computing at Pixar. I'm going to follow that with an example code uh, which is similar to the kinds of GPU software that we develop. Uh, this will provide examples for uh, of structures and patterns which we use to make our GPU software faster and easier to work with. Uh, finally, I'll briefly talk about future directions for GPU development at Pixar. Uh, historically at Pixar, we have substituted GPU, real, uh, GPU preview time for lengthy CPU render times. Uh, the goal of this is to reduce render times in, in our asset pipeline. Artists and TDs use GPUs early in development, but uh, fall, later fall back into uh, CPU farm renders using Pixar's RenderMan renderer. Uh, because of the limitations of desktop GPU renders, uh, such as lack of global illumination and the limited memory capacity of GPUs on, on our individual workstations. Uh, if GPU results match uh, RenderMan results closely, we can postpone the switch from CPUs to GPUs until later in our asset pipeline. Uh, this allows artists to iterate more quickly, uh, and we hope to push that even further in the future. Uh, general purpose GPU computing allows us to use GPUs for uh, other features of our asset creation pipeline that don't involve <coughs> rendering. Uh, and now into some highlights of uh, GPU use in Pixar. Uh, LPIX is an interactive relighting engine which was developed for cars to improve lighting, uh, relighting times uh, and allow for real-time feedback for our lighters. Uh, the LPIX system has similarities to uh, G buffers or geometry buffers, if you're familiar with those, uh, it's, which are a commonly used screen space uh, technique. Uh, the idea behind LPIX is that you would do a render man render, uh, full quality, full film quality, uh, and you produce a set of buffers, for example, position buffers, normal buffers, that sort of thing, uh, material properties. Uh, and then upload these buffers to the GPU and then compute lighting on the GPU. So that allows you to uh, do things like move uh, lights around in the scene interactively uh, and change light parameters and material parameters in real time. Uh, in order for GPUs to be useful to us, we need single precision floating point results to match between the CPU and the GPU. If the results between the CPU and the GPU don't match, uh, GPU-based tools aren't really useful for as a preview for our artists. Uh, Shader Model 2 made uh, IEEE single precision floating point available on the GPU, so uh, since then we've been using uh, GPU previews for, for pretty much all of our assets. Uh, matching precision means that we can use GPU-based tools on user desktops substitute for expensive farm renders. Uh, and to make sure that uh, our CPU and GPU results match exactly, uh, we run uh, tests on standard shots and assets throughout our pipeline to make sure that there's uh, an exact correspondence on a per pixel basis. Uh, one important extension to OpenGL for, for the purposes of matching CPU to GPU uh, is the floating point texture support, uh, which is now a part of the OpenGL core pipeline. So if you're going to try to match uh, renders on the CPU and the GPU, uh, make sure that you use floating point textures in OpenGL. Uh, recent changes to the OpenGL pipeline have led to more common ground between OpenGL and uh, render man renders. Uh, modern OpenGL supports tessellation, screen space effects, and displacement. Uh, which are all features that we need to, to render our assets. Uh, there are still some uh, limitations to OpenGL's preview tool for us. For example, it doesn't do ray tracing as well as we'd like it to. Uh, and there are some uh, limitations due to the amount of memory on an individual workstation. Uh, but in general, uh, the real-time uh, performance makes up for uh, these shortcomings. And, and we really appreciate it. The ability to interactively work with our with our assets. Uh, geometry shaders are a technology that has opened up uh, a new avenue for GPU computing at Pixar. Uh, it, geometry shaders allow us to have real-time previews of procedurally generated geometry. Uh, for example, hair uh, and particles, 
uh, and in particular vegetation. Uh, so uh, a tool that was developed on Brave is, uh, is our vegetation preview. This is a plugin for Maya, and I believe it also plugs into Presto, which is our animation tool. Uh, the motivation behind this tool was to uh, was that during location scouting on Brave, our, our artists would place uh, cameras in the scene and do uh, do a render, and you know it would appear to be fine. Uh, and then when you get to the final render with with all of the elements included, uh, they discovered that uh, the camera, uh, the viewport, would be covered by vegetation. So uh, the vegetation preview. Uh, is, is actually uh, real-time inside our, our animation tool and allows scouts to place cameras and be certain that they wouldn't be obscured by leaves. Uh, later, this tool was used as an authoring tool for vegetation in, uh, in the sets department. Uh, the idea behind the vegetation preview is that you uh, take the source mesh, which you're going to grow the vegetation on, and you uh, expand the faces of the mesh into a set of volumes. Each of these volumes is a bucket. Uh, inside the bucket, you uh, run a CPU procedural, which uh, exactly matches between uh, the GPU render and the uh, CPU render man render, so that you guarantee that you have the same geometry in both. Uh, then you store the result of this into a vertex buffer object uh, and run a, a geometry shader over this vertex buffer object to extract uh, leaves and, and uh, vegetation out of it. Uh, some implementation notes, uh, the vertex buffer object contains one vertex per blade of grass or per uh, branch. Uh, and then a geometry shader uh, actually expands from texture data uh, each blade of grass into the volume. Uh, this generates exactly the same kind of, kind of look that you would get in, in the film. Uh, tessellation shaders are a very significant development in Pixar and we're still exploring the potential uh, of tessellation shaders in our asset pipeline. Uh, tessellation shaders uh, are broken into two components, the tessellation control shader and the tessellation evaluation shader. Uh, we like to think of the tessellation control shader as being roughly equivalent to uh, subdivision, uh, and the tessellation evaluation shader as being kind of like displacement after subdivision. Uh, and so this is how we map the concepts between the CPU and the GPU. Um, one place we've used uh, tessellation shaders is in uh, our hairstyle preview, uh, which I developed for Monsters University. Uh, on Monsters University, we have lots and lots of hair, including hairy crowds. Uh, due to huge numbers of hairy characters, we needed a real-time preview to assist our TDs in generating hairstyles for, uh, for crowds characters, in particular. Uh, there are three key requirements for this uh, hairstyle preview. Uh, firstly, we have to match the GPU renderer, in, in, particularly in terms of the widths of the hairs. Uh, otherwise, you don't get the, the correct shaping on, on your hairstyles. Uh, we have to, the second requirement is that hairs have to be separated visually. This is not something you get out of the render man render because uh, it's, it's really for the purpose of, of uh, finding particular problem hairs. Uh, and thirdly, uh, it had to show the volume of different pumps of hair. Uh, as being distinct from one another. So in order to match the shape of individual curves, uh, the hairs are subdivided using a tessellation shader. Uh, without tessellation shaders, the hair preview curvature wouldn't match the render, uh, render and uh, as a result, wouldn't be useful as a preview tool. Uh, in terms of separation of hairs, hairs are lit as if they're cylinders uh, to enhance shaping in the hairstyle and, and distinguish individual hairs from one another. Uh, and finally, to show the volume of the hair, uh, we use screen space ambient occlusion, or SSAO, which darkens corners which receive less light than flat surfaces. Uh, without SSAO, it's really hard to see volumes in the hair, uh, and particularly uh, if you have a strand of hair that's in front of uh, the rest of the hair volume, it's very difficult to tell which uh, hairs are in front of one another. Uh, we have a similar hair preview uh, called the fruit for our animators, which can be dynamically posed uh, and animated, uh, but has a little less detail, it has fewer uh, CDs, and it's less tessellated, uh, but it allows for, for us to see uh, during animation where hair will cover uh, other objects where, uh, where that's important for animators. Uh, and finally, 
uh, we have a, uh, a project called Open Subdiv. Uh, we've open sourced our proprietary subdivision libraries. Uh, the Open Subject uh, Open Subdiv project is free for commercial and non-commercial use. Uh, it exactly matches Pixar's in-house uh, subdiv technology, including uh, the inclusion of creases and matching the edge cases that we match in, in RenderMan. Uh, please attend our presentation later at uh, 3.30, I think it's in this, this room, 210A. Uh, so that just about covers the most recent highlights of GPU computing at Pixar. Relating this back to the OpenGL pipeline advances, uh, you can think of tessellation shader as being equivalent to subdivision and displacement, and the uh, geometry shader as being equivalent to render man procedurals. So now I'm going in, uh, to talk to you about uh, the demo that I, I wrote for, for this talk. Uh, it is a simple mass frame simulation that runs on, entirely on the GPU. Uh, it combines CUDA with OpenGL, and it uh, renders a set of jelly cubes interacting with one another. Uh, it's intended to show you how you can uh, write a tool that will work in a film production environment. It includes abstraction of interfaces and objects, support for easily adding and removing objects from the simulation, and altering parameters in real time. The source code is available on GitHub. Uh, it's been released under the GNU GPL uh, license, and uh, this is a QR code uh, of the uh, URL, so I'll leave that up for a second or two uh, so you can scan it. Uh, so to make sure that everyone's able to understand the demo, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the features of CUDA that are used in the demo. Uh, GPUs are very good at data parallel computation, and which are uh, where each element of data is assigned a thread. Uh, this is a great match for a mass frame system, uh, since we can divide the computation into two phases. In the first phase, uh, we assign one thread to each ma mass, and in the second phase, we assign one thread to each frame. Ideally, we want to avoid sharing data between threads, but if we have to, we want to do so in a very structured way. Uh, the idea is that we take a set of uh, data, we, uh, we assign threads to them in batches, which we call blocks in CUDA, uh, which are then able to share uh, uh, data using shared memory, uh, which is a cache inside uh, each streaming multiprocessor, uh, which each thread in the block has access to. Uh, so if you want to get the demo running on your machine, you'll have to download the CUDA toolkit for that. The actual demo also uses a few other libraries, uh, but this is all documented inside the source code. Uh, and I also recommend reading the CUDA Getting Started Guide, because that's pretty much essential if you're going to try and compile this. Uh, so uh, it's important to understand how threads and blocks are used for the purpose of improving performance on the GPU. Um, Multiple threads are grouped into blocks of fixed size in the demo. It's uh, 1,024 uh, threads per block. Uh, you can determine the ideal amount of threads per block by thinking about the occupancy, which is uh, a, a, the number of threads per, C, uh, per block compared to the maximum number of threads per block uh, that is supported by the GPU. And this can all be uh, worked out in the uh, 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 there's a spreadsheet called the Occupancy Calculator, which is uh, part of the CUDA toolkit, which you can use to compute all this. Uh, I'm actually going to run the demo so that you can see what it's, what it's like. Oh, runs, let's see, is it that way? Okay, here we go. So this is all running on this laptop here. And this runs at comfortably at 30 frames a second on the laptop, although the uh, indicator is showing that. Uh, it runs a little faster on uh, a desktop machine. But absolutely everything, including collision detection, is done on the, uh, on the GPU. Uh, and I'm going to go over uh, exactly how that uh, was implemented in the next few slides. So uh, a lot of the time you want to divide up a large array of n elements into uh, a particular set of threads per block. Uh, sometimes n won't be an exact multiple of the 
number of threads per block. And so this code is how you deal with it. This is a pattern we commonly use. Uh, you want to make sure that you understand how this works before you start working with uh, real data. Um, uh, and also make sure that uh, you check if the index is less than the number of elements uh, per computation uh, so that you avoid out of bounds of memory accesses. Uh, this code demonstrates how to use STL vectors in combination with uh, CUDA device arrays. Uh, this makes managing data on the GPU much more friendly, uh, which is important if you're going to be using CUDA in a production system. It allows you to push and pop data from uh, arrays that are going to interact with the GPU, uh, and uh, as long as you're not doing that while you're computing on the GPU. Uh, and we do this by pointing, in the, uh, pointing to the first uh, data element of the CPU array. Uh, and note about the, the simulation. Uh, the masses are simulated using explicit RK4, uh, and spring forces are computed using Hooke's law. Uh, we simulate using very small time steps to get around the need to, uh, to do an implicit simulation, which is much more complex and kind of outside of the uh, scope of this demo. The masses are structured in an axis aligned grid. Uh, and form a grid of cubes where one mass is at each vertex. So this is the actual structure that's used in the, uh, in the simulation, and you'll notice that it looks exactly like a, a C-struct. Uh, you can, uh, on the GPU, you can still access all the fields of this data structure as if you were calling C++ code. Uh, this arrangement is called an array of structures because the STL vector contains a sequence of instances of this particular struct. Uh, Unfortunately, this is not really the way you want to arrange your data if you're going to be computing uh, for real on the GPU. Uh, it's not an ideal data arrangement because uh, global memory accesses on the GPU, are, uh, uh, which are coalesced, have higher performance. Uh, so ideally, you want to have consecutive threads, uh, thread indices, access consecutive memory locations. And the way you do this is to arrange things in a structure of arrays format. Uh, this is slightly more complex to set up and manage, but on the other hand, you get uh, a market performance benefit uh, from arranging your data this way. And so uh, what you do to arrange data in this fashion is you take uh, your array of st uh, structures and you extract individual components out of the structure and put them into uh, arrays which are stored uh, in this single structure. Uh, so first you need to allocate the, uh, the individual arrays in global memory and copy the data onto the GPU. And then you need to allocate the struct itself in constant memory and copy the pointers uh, to each array onto the GPU. Uh, sorry, uh, <coughs> sorry, you need to allocate the, yeah, so you need to allocate the, the structure itself on the GPU in constant memory, which contains the pointers in GPU memory. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to access the, the data in the arrays because uh, CPU pointers and data can't be passed directly to the GPU. So uh, each stage of the RK4 algorithm in the demo has a corresponding CUDA kernel. Uh, essentially, RK4 is a weighted average of four uh, steps with Euler's method. Uh, setup frame uh, sets up the computing state, clear forces sets each mass uh, vector to zero, uh, force vector to zero, uh, and then the rest of the steps can sit, uh, continue as you would expect them to. Uh, uh, the springs uh, in the demo are simplified linear springs, uh, which work as you would expect. Uh, and this is the structure which is used. Uh, it's uh, the set of structural springs, which are axis aligned, bending springs, which connect each every second neighbor. Uh, and shear strings which connect diagonal neighbors. Uh, this is the string struct. Uh, strings index directly into the mass array uh, using uh, the indices mass zero and mass one. Uh, in the demo, the strings are kept as array of structures so that you can compare and contrast the two different methods of uh, laying out your data. Uh, in a high performance application, you want to, you should prefer using <coughs> Uh, data structures that are structured with arrays, but uh, this kind of layout is useful for initial prototyping uh, and, uh, and testing. Uh, so spring forces are calculated once per RK4 increment uh, to update each uh, stage's acceleration, uh, which means they're 
evaluated four, four times per frame. Uh, and on the CPU, before we uh, start calculating any of the spring forces, we construct a mapping from masses to springs uh, so that we know which springs are attached to which masses. Uh, and then we upload that as an array onto the GPU as well so that we can access uh, that mapping. Uh, and finally, uh, collisions uh, are computed uh, using a pre-pass axis line bounding box collision uh, on the CPU. Uh, and then we do a point-to-point -point comparison on the GPU, which is O of n squared. Uh, but this doesn't really affect us because we use shared memory uh, in the demo. You can inspect the source code uh, for more details. Uh, and since memory is shared, uh, we, uh, shared memory is an order of magnitude faster than global memory. It's, uh, it, it doesn't become the bottleneck like of the algorithm. Um, so you, uh, another note about shared memory, you can use shared memory to uh, share data between threads, but we prefer to think of shared memory, uh, a lot of the time we find it more useful to think of it as a managed cache or uh, scratch pad memory. So uh, the demo runs at 30 frames a second on a uh, G4670M on this laptop with 140,000 springs. Uh, performance is based on occupancy and global memory, uh, coalesce global memory accesses, uh, and uh, just skip over to future work. So a lot of our GPU computing in the past has been uh, preview render related, uh, but we're now looking at ways to convert our non-graphics computations to the GPU, for example, simulation deformers and procedurals uh, and, and post-processing effects. Uh, we're very excited about NVIDIA's Kepler architecture, which allows for dynamic parallelism, uh, where kernels are able to call other kernels uh, inside themselves. Uh, we're excited because it allows for us to uh, implement tree-based algorithms and recursive algorithms. And, and that's important for us because a lot, a lot of the algorithms that we use are tree-based and recursive. Uh, so uh, that's all I have to say about uh, GPGPU and Pixar. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Who wants to be the first one? Hi, um, I have two questions. The first one is, how do you edit the geometry shaders and installation shaders for your hair and vegetation if you want to add procedural effects to it? So you only have vertices, you said. And when you build a geometry, let's say you want to add curls or whatever. Can you do that? In theory, you can do that in geometry shaders and installation shaders. How do you let the artist configure that? And question number two is, how do you deal with big data sets in your uh, simulation, CUDA? With shared memory because it has uh, very limited capacity and you have to decide how to load stuff from the curriculum part. Sure. Uh, so, the, in terms of allowing our artists to configure things, uh, a lot of the, the generation up front is done on the CPU. Uh, we are looking at converting our pipelines over to, <coughs> to GPU computation, which is part of what I was talking about, uh, you know, general purpose GPU computations. But, uh, in general, if you wanted to uh, have some other, uh, add some parameters or that sort of thing, you would recompile the geometry shader on the client. So would uh, you do that or would the artist be able to do that somehow? Uh, right now, I would be doing that. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of uh, managing large data sets, uh, for the most part, our data fits within uh, six gigs, which is what we expect for, for an individual asset. Uh, in our asset pipeline. Uh, if we we're going to try and do this with uh, with full scenes or multiple characters, we would have to consider uh, doing using some kind of outer core, uh, like page vaulting or something like that. Who's next? I have a few more questions about the curve uh, display preview. So I'm um, just curious about what kind of, how are you uploading your curve representation to the GPU? Uh, so the way we do that is uh, we basically take the control vertices and the uh, per hair parameters and we upload those as uh, in, in, as vertex buffer object attributes. So is it a direct mapping between <laughs> like RI curve 
presentation into the actual video that you're sending out? Yes, yeah, it's doing exactly the same kind of, like it's running our subdivision on in the tessellation shader. So, uh, and what kind of, um, what number of curves are you typically previewing at any one time? Uh, I probably, uh, something like 400,000 curves. Uh, is is what we get an interact that's like 12 frames a second for 400,000 per curve. And is this, is this with a decent number of control vertices per curve? Uh, 12 per curve. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and just out of curiosity, is that, is that with sort of multi sampling for anti aliasing? Uh, no, we don't. Yeah, it, it, it's basically slow to crawl if we implement that. Uh, okay. The way we get around that is we use uh, bilateral filtering. Pass okay. on, on the viewport afterwards, uh, which tends to get rid of most of those. Or I think we may have switched that to Instagram filter. So. Okay. Thanks. If we don't ask questions, we got box lunches next. <laughs> Hi. When you're when you're porting from the CPU to the GPU, when do you start trying to think like a Kepler? I mean, do you start off by trying to come up with the most parallel algorithm and then work backwards to the Kepler architecture, or do you go the other direction? Uh, most of the time, you do, you start out, well, I start out with uh, with the shared memory uh, in mind, uh, but, but more, like I said before, more as uh, like a scratch pad memory. Uh, I think of it as a, uh, as like a cache, so, if I'm gonna, if I have a loop, for example, inside the kernel or inside the algorithm that I'm gonna be implementing, uh, I'll try and figure out what data is is uh, not like is needs to be cached for that loop, uh, and then I'll immediately move that into shared memory. Things like uh, moving to structure arrays uh, tends to happen later in, uh, in the development process because you kind of want to lock your, your algorithm down before you start messing around with with uh, rearranging your data structures for it. So the soft body demo was, uh, well, just a demo. I was wondering if you use similar things for a full, let's say, hair simulation that has much, much more than 140k springs and where ON squared collision detection may not be the optimal solution anymore. Uh, so we are in the process of developing, uh, or, or at least we're doing the initial investigations into developing uh, mass spring sims for the uh, o of n squared is only for the purposes of this demo. Uh, we will probably go with a, either a mounting volume hierarchy or an octree uh, to cull individual points against one another. So. Come on, left side. Uh, for the physics simulation package, have you considered the uh, NVIDIA physics library itself and stand up right your own? Uh, we have. I, I'm not entirely sure because, you know, I, I'm not a member of the research department. Uh, but I think that uh, we've we've looked at, like, for example, bullet physics. Uh, I don't know whether uh, we've looked at physics specifically. Do you have to match your CPU uh, simulation results? Yes, we do. Oh, that's a requirement. Yeah. I see. Any more questions? Can you please put the QR code back up? Oh, sure. Yeah. All right, this is the part. Just know that networking launch is, is getting started right now, so please stop by there. Pay attention to the tracks coming up in the afternoon and other Pixar uh, presentation will happen as well as many other uh, media tracks. Appreciate your attendance now.